You know, it was great we had this long discussion, and now we are finally coming down to a vote. But everybody should know there's a very good reason marijuana is illegal. Last year, it killed 480,000 people. Four, oh, no, never mind, that's tobacco. Sorry. All right. 140,000. Marijuana killed 140,000 people last year. Oh, alcohol. Sorry. Sorry. Got my numbers mixed up here. Oh, oh 500. It's got to be 500. This is a dangerous illegal substance. We must ban it. We cannot let it be legal. 500 people died. Oh, that's Tylenol. We are talking about a substance with no lethality. The time for marijuana prohibition is over, and it's been over for quite some time. The war on drugs was an abject failure that put tons of people in prison based on faulty reasoning and faulty science. And it hurt communities who definitely didn't deserve it. We fixed a lot of those problems over the years. We've moved in the right direction. It's essentially decriminalized in this state, but it's still not legal. 53% of Minnesotans agree that we should end marijuana prohibition. 68% of Americans agree we should end marijuana prohibition. And in that same poll and with the Minnesotans, only 36% supposed, opposed, 36% which tells you there's a significant amount of Republicans that think it's about time we end marijuana prohibition. Prohibition has worked about as well as it did when we did it with alcohol in the early 1900s. When you prohibit something, you make it criminal, and that only benefits the criminals. It doesn't help anyone. It enriches them through violence. They don't call the Consumer Reports Bureau to report they got some bad weed. They go and shoot them. But if they could go in a safe environment where the product is safely tested so they don't have fentanyl, it's completely non-lethal. When you see any death where marijuana is involved, there's always something else. There's always something else because you cannot die from THC alone. That doesn't mean it's a safe substance we, could encourage, we should encourage, just like alcohol. We shouldn't say, everybody go out and get hammered. This is great. Go smoke weed. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying, this shouldn't be illegal anymore. And only 36% of Minnesotans disagree. That's a sizable amount of Republicans who believe marijuana prohibition should be over. And a lot of people will say, well, marijuana is a gateway drug. Because when we look at heroin addicts or anything, they always start with marijuana. If that's the logic for what a gateway drug is, alcohol is certainly a much more dangerous gateway drug. Almost every single person who eventually finds them addicted to heroin started with alcohol. And before that, you know what else is a psychoactive drug that could be a uh, gateway drug by that definition? Caffeine. And if you look at our desks, we got a lot of drug users around here. So it doesn't make any sense to call it a gateway drug. But you know what makes it a gateway drug? Do you know what makes it actually dangerous? Is prohibiting it. Because then when you have to go down the street alley and buy your little dime bag of weed, that puts you in a place where somebody might be selling heroin. They might be selling. Adderall. They might be selling a litany of incredibly dangerous narcotics, some of which can be prescribed by a doctor. But if they can go into a store and get greeted by a nice man who's like, hey man, how are you doing today? Uh, we got some sativa here. Indica. That is where you want somebody to be doing this non-dangerous substance and acquiring it there rather than going in the alley. If we put it in a safe retail environment, where it's tested and we ensure that it's just cannabis, it's not laced with fentanyl, it's safer. And it's not a gateway drug. Now the next most common criticism is that, 
We don't have a roadside test, and that is a valid criticism. There is no roadside test. That is very, very concerning. However, we don't have a roadside test for opiates. We don't have a roadside test for cough medicine. We don't have a roadside test for a litany of things, like just sleep deprivation. But those are still available at your drugstore. So that doesn't mean we just ignore that problem, because that is a real problem. And that's why this bill puts $10 million. I think we can juice that number a little more in conference, I hope. But we can, it puts $10 million to drug recognition enforcement police officer training. Because that, if, if a police officer pulls somebody over, gets them out of the car, thinks they're intoxicated, they have bloodshot eyes, they're glassy, but they know they all say they have them do the breath, breathalyzer and they're not drunk on alcohol, well, they'll still run a sobriety test. They can get somebody with the proper training to come down and test them whether they're going to be safe behind the wheel. We already do that for cough medicine and the like. We can do that for cannabis, and especially legal cannabis that's been tested and proven to be safe. And the majority of Minnesotans have already used cannabis, over 50% easily. It's available for the people who want it. So the next big concern is about the kids, another very valid concern. We know that it has a negative effect on brain development, just like alcohol or tobacco. So we want to be very careful when legalizing this substance that then kids could get it. However, you look at states that have legalized, teen use is about the same. Why is teen use about the same within the margin of error of all the polling that's done? Because they can get it already. We're not stopping anybody from anything right now. We're just encouraging a kid to have a bad interaction with a police officer when they're caught with dope in their back seat. We don't see an increase in youth use. And if we did, yes, that would be a great, great concern to all of us, regardless of what side of this argument you want. But one thing that's interesting, we do see overall cannabis use increase. But it's not the kids. It's all of you people. It's the boomers who then feel comfortable to go, ah, you know, I did this when I was a teenager, I'll go ahead and try it today. And what's the difference between a 65-year-old going, a 65-year-old going to get a joint instead of a glass of scotch? I would argue the joint is the safer choice. And last session, we legalized intoxicating THC already. Right now, if you want to go get high on THC, you can walk literally, what, three blocks from here to the BP on the corner, get yourself a little bag of hemp edibles, which have intoxicating THC in them already. You know what we haven't seen is a rash of people who are high all the time that can't drive and an increase in accidents. It's here now, and the hemp industry has demonstrated that they can do it safely. So what's the public policy benefit of doing this? There's only one public policy benefit, and that is the elimination of the black market, which still exists. That takes care of the crime we see associated with drugs, and it also makes it so it's not a gateway drug that leads people on the dark path of addiction. However, on the flip side, so I've kind of gone after people who are against this. There's some people who say marijuana is not addictive. It certainly is addictive. You can see that everywhere. Any, any serious person can see that. But compared to other addictions like alcohol, well, at least the marijuana addiction is not going to kill you. But it's still harmful. Now, this bill has a lot of work to do, which is why it's going to go to conference. But it's undeniably the right path. That's where the evidence shows, 
And if you want to say people vote with their actions, 68% of Americans support this, 53% of Minnesotans support this, and I guarantee you it's higher now. When I polled my district, I had 81% support cannabis legalization. 81%. I, thought, I didn't think it would be nearly that high. But that was just two years ago. So what do we need to do to make this bill better? And I have to say, Representative Stevenson has been incredibly helpful to work with. We've moved quite a ways. He's taken some amendments, like uh, the DRE funding for the drug record enforcement officers uh, that a lot of people over here would like to see. He's limited, limited from five pounds, which is just a catastrophic amount, as we saw when it was presented in committee, down to 1.5 pounds. We've made some good strides on this bill. It's working its way. Now, I've already talked about, through the amendments, the biggest problems that I see. And that's the licensing system, the woke ideology in here. Because Minnesotans want legal weed, but they don't necessarily want all the politically partisan bells and whistles you're tacking onto it. My hope is we can minimize those in conference committee. We can make it so this bill has by significant bipartisan support. But as you heard from a lot of members over here, well, you kind of hamstring cities. They don't really have a lot of flexibility. It's better than where the, when the bill started, but it still has a little work to go. I'd like to see if we can work on that in conference committee. I agree, you can't completely ban it from your city because that defeats the purpose of eliminating the black market. But hamstringing cities on the placement of these businesses is not what the cities want, I can tell you that. We've heard from a lot of our cities that that's not the way to go. And with the licensing system and the ban on vertical integration in particular, that is just bad policy. And see, that's where I see ideology is creeping in here rather than doing what's best for Minnesotans. Because, okay, I get it. When you look at the medical marijuana program, two companies dominate the market, and I assume that's where that came from. But that's, that bill, the medical marijuana legislation that was passed, basically made that the only way that was going to be. By allowing vertical integration, that doesn't mean that big business is going to come in here and take over the market. It's going to mean that we will have low-cost marijuana, which will help strangle the black market. The low tax rate in this bill is actually pretty good at doing that, but if you can't vertically integrate and cut down on some of those costs, you're going to have a low tax rate, but you're still going to have expensive product. And that's going to hurt the number one public policy benefit of this bill, which is eliminating the black market. So we need to get rid of that prohibition on vertical integration. It's the right policy. It's only, the only argument against it is ideological. If this doesn't eliminate the black market, as we've seen in California, in particular, New York especially, the black market's alive and well despite legal cannabis because of the way the bill was written to be anti-business. So let's not do that in this bill. Let's allow businesses to operate and sell a competitively, competitive product that consumers want. And as far as the social equity stuff in this bill that I strongly disagree with, that I think it's unfair and it prioritizes putting these cash businesses in areas that will only bring problems to those communities. Well, you could get rid of all that stuff and keep the grant programs that are social equity based in the back of, your, in the, back of the bill here and still accomplish some of those social equity goals. So if we can move towards that in conference, this bill would come back with local control, a better licensing system that's fair, I expect you to see significant bipartisan support. And I would happily help you with that if we can move in that direction in conference committee. Ending mar marijuana prohibition is the right way to go. It absolutely is. It's what the public wants. It's a safe substance. And the prohibition now only benefits criminals. Because if all the alcoholics today who go around and 
drunk drive, kill people by crashing their cars, beat their spouses. If all those alcoholics were potheads, we'd live in a better world.